Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Hard West with me, Bring It Down. Let's check out this crash stagecoach. Follow Cassandra's directions. The party soon arrived at the location of a stagecoach crash. The putrid smell of decay indicated the accident took place several days ago. A flock of vultures feasted on the well-heeled passengers. One of the birds looked up from its feast, fixing the company with a roomy glare before slowly flapping skyward. Part of began rummaging through the pockets of the dead, whistling casually. So he were picking daisies. Cassandra, finding nothing of interest, was begging to re beginning, not begging, to regret coming. And when she spied a thin leather suitcase uh, sitting in the dust, little typos keep throwing me off. Opening the case, she discovered a document written in dark blue ink on thick paper, adorned with official stamps and seals. It appeared to be the deed to a silver mine somewhere in the Rockies. Cassandra pocketed it while her companions rummaged through the rest of the spoils. They left. Alright, uh, to the pilgrimage. Cassandra and her companions came across a group of people camping out in the wild. They had numerous tents set up, along with carts and horses. There were wooden crosses and ornate incense holders everywhere they looked. A man wearing priest attire gr attire greeted them on behalf of his flock, said his name was Kay Elspes. He explained that he was uh, leading these people on pilgrimage. But they were currently enjoying a much needed rest. Cassandra remarked that the beaten paths around the camp suggest they've been camping there for some time. Elspeth winced and admitted in a low voice that Cassandra was right. They weren't resting at all. Actually, they were lost. His map had turned out to be inaccurate. He couldn't bring himself to dash the hopes of so many pilgrims by telling them they had to go back. Thus far, he had been able to convince everyone that they were still on the Alaka Shrine Trail. I secretly tried to figure out where it was. Now he's losing hope of ever finding it. Cassandra had never heard of the Calica Shrine. Chaos must explain that the Calica Shrine was a pre-Columbian ritual site, that it contained several carved uh, figurines of human skulls adorned with Christian symbols, crosses, three-cornered symbols, and fish. According to Elspis, the existence of these symbols confirmed that Christianity was the world's sole true religion. Unfortunately, however, the map he'd brought a bought from a merchant in Adelante had proven false. Now he would need to admit his failure and destroy the faith and resolve of his flock. Unless the true map were found, Cassandra finished for him. Elspeth nodded fervently. He promised to share his supplies with Cassandra if she found a map. He had heard that the Garcia Memento Family Library might contain clues to the shrine's location. Cassandra promised to take a look if time permitted. Right, we will go to the Garcia Pimento residence. Matron Poqueria, uh, Adomira Garcia Pimento, was one of the last of the venerable Garcia Pimento clan, which had flourished in the New World for hundreds of years. Now the family was a shadow of its former glory, but the Garcia Pimento Library remained the greatest and most complete collection of works detailing the New World and the rise of Mexico. May, M M M -E, M -M -E, Garcia Pimento jovially greeted Ladia as Cassandra had introduced herself and guessed she was here to see the fabled library. Uh, Cassandra nodded, hoping quietly she could find the location of the Calica Shrine amid the books. Matron nodded and led them inside. There they were joined by a scrawny figure in clothes that had once been very fine, who were clearly showing their wear. Matron Garcia Pimentel said this was her son, Porfirio, or Porfirio, and that he would be their guide to the library. Sandra curtsied, taking a closer look at the young man. On top of a hunched, scrawny body sat a large head, with a bulging lump in the middle of his forehead. His skin was mottled and unnatural looking. He inclined his head slightly at all times. She suppressed a shiver. As they walked into the library, Porfirio told Cassandra about various landmarks in the area, spouting an endless stream of historical facts, interrupted only by his slight stutter. Although at first he seemed consumed by his study of history, Cassandra soon realized his trembling hands and darting eyes and blush... Oh, and blush meant something completely different. He was attempting to court her. In another context it might have been endearing, but she was unsettled by the cold lump she felt in her stomach. 
Porfirio broke her reflections, asking whether there was anything in particular she would like to hear about. Uh, she asked specifically about the famous yet mysterious Calica Shrine. According to Porfirio, the Calica Shrine was the crown jewel of the area's historical attractions. Believed to have been built long before the first Europeans set foot in the New World, it contained several painted skull sculptures called Calicas that inexplicably bore ancient Christian symbols, fish, crosses, and various three-cornered ornaments. The shrine was considered by many as the ultimate confirmation that Christianity was the world's one true religion. There had been a minor military struggle over who controlled it, with the winner doing their utmost to camouflage its position. When they met their downfall, however, its precise location was lost to history. This last sentence, Porfirio's deformed lips twisted in what Cassandra interpreted as an approximation of a smile. She guessed aloud that he knew so much, she was sure he must know the location. The young man looked away shyly, but Cassandra pressed, he nodded, his deformed head in confirmation. He said he would tell Cassandra the location in exchange for a kiss. Finding her revulsion, she brought herself to lay a gentle kiss where a person's cheek would be. At the last moment, Porfirio turned his head and Cassandra found herself kissing his lips. Then he grasped her head to his forced his tongue into her mouth. Hmm. Yeah, no, Cassandra jerked her head back, breaking the kiss, and backhanded him to the ground. He looked at her grimly, and said he would tell her nothing. She treated him like that. Cassandra protested, but he was unmoved. He motioned back to the hall, where the rest of her companions were waiting. She was happy to get out of this place as quickly as she could. A Cassandra's heart sunk when she reached the foyer to find Hardin unconscious in a chase lounge. Lady Garcia Pimento explained that she had left the group alone with a bottle of brandy and returned to find him like this. She suggested uh, that Cassandra and her friend stay the night and leave the next morning. A Cassandra felt a dawning premonition and allowed herself to focus on it. Cassandra felt a great danger emanating from the Garcia Pimento house that extended far beyond kissing disfigured men. In a blink, she had a vision of herself in a bridal gown that was slick with blood. She blinked, the feeling passed, leaving a painful throbbing in its place. Hmm. Alright, well despite her vision, Cassandra accepted the invitation. Probably an awful idea. But they were shown the, to their rooms. Cassandra was given a basin of hot water. A premonition to put her on edge. She did not want to stay in this place any longer than she absolutely had to. She put out the lights, but did not undress. She lay on the bed and pretended to fall asleep, and waited until the house was silent. From down the hall she heard a strange mu uh, snuffling moan. When it recurred, she deduced that it was Porfirio's snores. She waited a little longer to be sure, and it then decided it was time to make her move. As she woke the now sober Hardin, told him to remain silent. The two quietly made their escape. I'm right, still looking for it. We got a new card at least. The King of Diamonds plus Foresight and a passive. I could give it to her, I guess. We're going to fix up Harden real fast. He needs that aim. Alright, let's go to the... Let's go to the Edelante. Alright, that's all we need to do there. Now let's go to the Gambling Den. Harden led Cassandra to the notorious outlaw gambling den. The venue was set up in a cliffside cave, 
an ancient Indian pueblo. There were no lights on the outside, but Hardin pointed out two guards concealed against the crumbled walls, next to a narrow entrance with a thick black curtain. Inside, they found a wide repertoire of gambling tables, an assortment of colorful, dangerous looking characters, and an ample supply of liquor. Sandra sat within hearing range of a drunken prospector, and he's dropped on his story. The prospector claimed to own a map to the wreck of an old Spanish treasure ship. Arden dismissed it as bragging, but Cassandra was interested. Cassandra probed what the man's future held. Her initial attempts were inconclusive. Cassandra felt she was already losing her luck her lucky streak. Now she went on. Cassandra saw the man suffer a violent death. It thoroughly distressed her, and she obtained no useful information. As a searing pain pierced her brain, she saw the prospector lying dead in an old shipwreck, surrounded by piles of gold. As the vision faded, she managed to recognize a landmark that pinpointed three possible locations for the wreck. She came back to reality, nearly collapsed from exhaustion. Cassandra left the premises to recover her strength. Alright, get our premonitions back, and let's go to the derelict shipwreck. On the sharp rocks of the bay uh, sat the decomposing wreck of a caravel. Almost entirely disintegrated, they could barely make out the name on the side of the ship. Louis... 30... I forgot what the L stands for. 35, 37. Sandra doubted it would yield much. As she decided to search the wreck anyway. As he descended into the wreck, Arden stepped on a sea urchin and had to be helped, limping onto the shore. A closer inspection of the wreck had yielded an ivory comb and some golden teeth, worth 100 pesos or so. Arden suggested there might be more valuables at the bottom of the bay, but that obtaining them would mean heading with more dangerous sea fauna. And Cassandra asked Paco to dive and look for more treasure. Sandra's companion disappeared beneath the sparkling water. After a number of reconnaissance dives, the swimmer submerged for a close look, sorry, for close to a minute, before erupting to the surface holding a small ornate chest. Inside, Cassandra found a collection of ivory pieces that would be worth at least a thousand pesos to a collector. It's time to move on. Alright, the lonesome shipwreck. On its side of the shallows, the shipwreck looked like a beached whale. When Cassandra's team headed inside, they found it filled with the dead bodies of its crew and passengers. The air was heavy with the stench of, of the dead. Cassandra knew the dangers decomposing bodies presented. But she chose to search the cargo holds anyway. Uh, the cargo holds were filled with dark, scintillating rocks. Alicia became agitated, saying it was a pitch blend. The nausea-inducing, vitality-draining the natives called Curse Rock. She ran out, shouting for the others to do the same. Hardin shouted after Felicia that she was a superstitious coward. She shouted back that Hardin was an overbold fool. And Cassandra ignored them as she looked for actual valuables. Searching the dead was slow and taxing. Cassandra managed to find the captain's personal luggage, along with some ancient photographs. Cassandra found a broken watch engraved with the name Franco Morales. It might be worth 100 pesos to a collector. She resolved to look for more, but suddenly felt faint. After a brief moment of confusion, she fell to the ground unconscious. Cassandra woke several hours later, nauseated and weak, unable to travel. The company was forced to camp on the beach that day. Hi, right, the moldy shipwreck. Oh, L is 50. That's right. What was that 50? What was it 37? So what, 87? An ancient wreck of a Spanish galleon sat in a small cove and looked harmless enough. The name on the bow read Amaya Calvo. The air smelled of dried seaweed and mold. Sandra motioned to her companions to follow her inside. Descending into the cargo hold, the team found crates filled with valuables and expensive materials. Much of the treasure had decayed with time. However, a good portion of the silver and gold objects could be salvaged with a significant amount of work. Cassandra decided they needed the money. 
As the salvage continued, Arden became wary. He told Cassandra that the longer they stayed there, the better chance someone would arrive. Perhaps lay in wait and attack once they had retrieved all, the tre all of the treasure. He suggested retreating with what they had now, rather than hope they could get away with everything. Yet Cassandra dismissed Harden's doubts, insisting they retrieved the treasure in its entirety. The attack came at dawn. Cassandra and her companions fought valiantly, uh, but the bandits still managed to injure some of the party. Arco was hit in the arm. The wound bled prodigiously. Worse still, the shots could be heard for miles. Cassandra cursed at the thought that the authorities might become alarmed. But despite the injury, however, the team recovered all the loot on the ship. It totaled several thousand pesos at least. We almost have enough for what we need. Alright, to the Mexican Army Fort. The team arrived at the Mexican Army stronghold in the Western Territory. The terrain was challenging and progress had been slow. They were grateful for the res uh, respite. Arden offered to buddy up uh, to the grunts. He said he'd seen what they knew. Sorry, he said he'd see what they knew, maybe win some of their money. Cassandra nodded, said she would see what she could learn from the commander. Commander Alberto J. Barboya, uh, Baruco? I greeted Cassandra gallantly and offered refreshments. He excused his humble surroundings, explaining that order was maintained in this region by the private militias of wealthy industrialists, such as Ricardo La Fortuna. Consequently, Mexican military had only a minor presence in this area. Cassandra asked how it was possible for someone like La Fortuna to blockade his competitors' assets. The commander told Cassandra that La Mr. La Fortuna was a benefactor of the United Mexican States. The government trusted him and gave him many liberties. He explained that the blockade Cassandra had referred to was only a training exercise for his merchant fleet, but on a response to the rise of piracy in the Caribbean. A rumbling noise and jeering voices from outside caught the commander's attention. He got up from his desk and looked through the window, Cassandra joining him. Harden was quarreling with a soldier. The commander excused himself, leaving Cassandra in the room alone. Cassandra searched the files, looking for information about her own exploits. It took Cassandra a good while to skim the files. There was nothing major yet, but she did find a few reports. Uh, she stole the incriminating files. Cassandra could hear the commander's steps in the corridor. She hastily closed everything and leapt back to her seat. The commander walked in, visibly upset. He explained Harden had gotten into trouble playing dice, but that he would overlook it as his soldiers shouldn't have engaged in gambling in the first place. Still, he said, Cassandra and her crew should leave immediately and not return. Cassandra curtsied gracefully and left. A Harden's bruised countenance told the tale of his gambling adventure with the soldiers. As they left, he told her he had won some money, but more importantly, he had acquired a pair of loaded dice. Cassandra's skilled hands, and a dice game would now be less of a gamble. Alright, Cassandra and her companions returned to the gambling den. The place was bustling as ever. Uh, Cassandra joined a dice game. Standing by the game table, Cassandra felt weight of the, felt the weight of the dice in her hand. She decided to replace the dice with her gimmicked pair. Cassandra gave a discreet nod to Harden, who thought they attracted the attention of a player sitting at another table. While all the player's heads were turned, the swift movement, Cassandra replaced the dice in her hand with the loaded pair. She easily won the round, earning 323 pesos. Uh, she rattled the dice and exerted her mind to predict the outcome. Sandra found it hard to sense the outcome of dice rolls. There were so many changes for each movement of the hand, but she got something out of it. She won 185 pesos. Alright, she rolled the loaded dice without trickery. We lost money. Despite Cassandra's best efforts, luck was against her that night. She lost 145 pesos.
Uh, she tapped a loaded dice and rolled for the win. 323. We just need to do this until we get all the money that we need. Alright, then we will play a game of... Uh, Cassandra joined a high stakes poker table. A group of four men were sat at a table, playing poker with a professional like uh, silence. Uh, Cassandra had a feeling they were practicing ahead of the La Fortuna Soray. Cassandra put on a heavy accent and introduced herself as Lydia Morozov. Four men were Noyan Ak Akazoglu, weapons manufacturer, Dr. Fabian Fay, MD, Sylvester Ailman, a sawmill owner, and Pedro Ramius, an oil broker. Cassandra asked to join. Ben said she was welcome. She had something to gamble. Cassandra offered a deed to a silver mine in the American Rockies. Cassandra's contribution was accepted with contented murmurs. They dealt her in. Cassandra struck up a coquettish conversation. So I stroke up coquettish conversations while accidentally showing off her cards. Meanwhile, she keenly observed her adversaries. Sandra lost what she had bet, but noted several tells for each of the four players. This knowledge could come well in handy during the big game. To return to the lobby. Now that Cassandra had the necessary 25,000 pesos, she was ready to conquer La Fortuna's grand tournament. Yes, I'm pretty sure in order to get one of the stars, we had to find that shrine. And I goofed up by uh, pulling away from the uh, Porfirio. All right, uh, the big tournament reception hall. A Cassandra and her companions arrived at the building where the poker soiree was to be held. The imposing building was made entirely out of cast iron and glass, a feat unparalleled in Mexico. They had some time to kill before the game started. Cassandra wandered the floor and sized up the players while she waited for the tournament to begin. There was both players from all corners of the land, hence with anticipation of the conflict to come. Finally, the cashier booth opened. Players began to fork over the cash necessary to register. It's still time for Cassandra to mingle with the guests. Uh, Cassandra asked her companions to wait and proceeded into the crowd. The soiree was first and foremost a social pa pageant, where the rich and the famous could show off their opulence to their peers, or have their success in the faces of their competitors. But everyone appeared friendly on the surface. The competitive tension in the hall was palpable. Cassandra eavesdropped on an argument between one of the contestants and a lady. A corpulent sweaty man in a tall hat was arguing with his wife. She said he would again lose their fortune. All the while, he assured her that he had been working on his gambling skills. This seemed to enrage her further. She launched into a tally of his various tells, while he denied all. It seemed Cassandra now knew what to look for. Cassandra returned to enjoy the evening, taking note of everything and everyone she saw. One of Cassandra's competitors left his drink unattended while he showed off his new pocket watch. Cassandra thought back to the bottle of laxatives she had obtained earlier. While crude and unfair, it most certainly eliminate a player from the game before it even started. And Cassandra swiftly poured the contents of the bottle into the man's drink. The gentleman returned to his drink, downing it in a single swallow. The smile lasted a while, ultimately faded into a terrified grimace. He excused himself and rushed away in a sprint. Uh, Cassandra smiled imperceptibly. Cassandra returned. Okay, I already read that. Cassandra caught a glimpse of a middle aged gentleman gazing at her with a cryptic smile. She returned the man's gaze and smiled back. A few minutes later, the man approached her, presenting himself as Jim Vaughn. He commended her on her competitive attitude, alluding to her underhanded activities in the a reception room. Seeing her frown, he laughed and assured her he would not expose her. He said Cassandra reminded him of his younger self. He was looking forward to testing his skill against hers in the upcoming game. 
Uh, Cassandra thanked him with an expression of genuine camaraderie. All right, Cassandra submitted her entry fee, $25,000. and waited for the game to start. Cassandra has just submitted her 25,000 pesos when a slender Hispanic man in an impeccable tailcoat and top hat approached her with a grin. Uh, Cassandra guessed this must be Ricardo La Fortuna. As if reading her mind, he bowed and placed a gallant kiss on her gloved hand. La Fortuna presented himself and asked for Cassandra's name. She treated him to her Russian alias, Lydia Morozov. La Fortuna bowed lower still, and wished Lydia good luck in the upcoming game. She curtsied before proceeding to the ga uh, gaming table. The first round of the game had 20 contestants divided among four tables. Among them was Jim Vaughn. Sandra realized her table only had four players. One must have been missing. Uh, she also noted that she had been placed with the corpulent man whom she had been seen arguing with his wife earlier. She was seated She was seated, and the rules were explained. The two winners from each table would meet for the second round, which would determine the grand champion of the gala, the owner of a rare piece of jewelry uh, being staked by Mr. La Fortuna himself. When the chips were distributed, the cards were dealt, and the game started. Initially the game was casual and easy. Cassandra singled out two candidates for elimination and definitely defeated them using her acute gambling skills. Only one man was left at her table, and she knew his tells, having overheard his argument with his wife. As she read him like an open book, soon he was dispatched as well. The croupier congratulated Cassandra, telling her he transferred her chips to the main table for the final round. There was an hour break between rounds one and two. The tournament was in full swing. The losing tears were dried by cheerful senoritas and gallons of alcohol, while the winners gloated, prayed, and luxuriated, luxuriated in the lobby. Cassandra looked around, sizing up her competition. Uh, one of the finalists discreetly retreated to his room. Intrigued, Cassandra followed him. As they left the party atmosphere of the crowd, the gambler accelerated his pace, crossing the steel and glass corridors of the palace with unusual haste. Then, when he entered the hotel wing, he disappeared. Cassandra looked helplessly around the halls of the hotel. There were two rows of identical doors, one on each wall of the hall. One, she noticed, had light shifting from underneath it. As she approached it, saw it had been left slightly ajar. She peered through the opening, to her surprise, saw the man injecting himself something from a syringe. Morphine. The gambler lay on the bed, oblivious to everything around him. He was in the full rapture of a morphine shot. Cassandra slipped inside his room, gave him another injection of an even stronger dose. Cassandra hesitated, wondering if her lack of experience administering drugs might spell this man's demise. I've come this far, she thought, emptying the syringe. He certainly didn't protest. Rather, he closed his eyes and fell asleep with a blissful smile on his lips. Cassandra left a gentle kiss on his sweaty forehead and left the room. Cassandra returned to enjoy the evening, all the while looking around carefully. Uh, once the break was over, Cassandra proceeded to the table. The players sat down to the final round of La Fortuna's poker tournament. Along with Cassandra, three other men were still in the competition. One defaulted when he failed to arrive at the designated hour. The others were Jim Vaughn and Dr. Fabian Fay both of whom she'd met in the Pueblo Casino. Names were exchanged, cards were dealt, the game began. Now, the stakes in the final game were much higher, and so was the skill of the participants. But as the game progressed, Cassandra's chip supply diminished, though she was on the brink of bankruptcy. She needed a decisive move to improve her situation. As she could target Dr. Fabian Fay, whose stash was the smallest, or Jim Vaughn, who had been doing extremely well thus far. At this point, his skill seemed unmatched. And knowing his tells from the Pueblo Casino, he decided to attack Dr. Fay. Dr. Fabian Fay never fully held his cards. He lifted them slightly off the table and peeked at them. Every so often, he would pick his fine mustache, but Cassandra quickly determined this was not a tell. Although the doctor kept his composure throughout the evening, Cassandra knew what she was looking for. If he held his breath, he was bluffing. 
In the earlier game in the Pueblo Casino, she knew just when to call and when to bluff. Before long, the doctor had no more chips on the left on the table. He stood up, bowed, complimented each of the players, and thanked them for this worthy entertainment, then strode off into the lobby to relax. To win the tournament, Sandra still had one opponent. Sorry, still had one more opponent to defeat. Sorry, it's a lot of reading. My eyes are starting to glaze over. <laughs> she decided to tackle Jim Vaughn next. Jim Vaughn was a true master of the gambling table. Smart, funny, and courteous. He was impenetrable to conventional scrutiny. If Cassandra wanted to defeat him, she needed to use her unique ability. Cassandra took a deep breath and tried something new. To smile and see the future at the same time. Letting her instincts guide her cards and her chips, Cassandra, Cassandra managed to outplay and defeat Jim Vaughn. He looked at her with admiration and laughed out loud and thanked her for an amazing game. Cassandra vanquished her final opponent. She had won the tournament. Ricardo La Fortuna presented Cassandra with the grand prize, a beautiful piece of jewelry that was rumored to be a lucky charm. Cassandra accepted the prize with grace and humility. La Fortuna told Cassandra she was welcome to visit him in his residence anytime. Cassandra promised she would come, then departed into the crowd. As Cassandra made to leave, Jim Vaughn approached her and offered to buy her a glass of port. She accepted. Mr. Vaughn was visibly delighted. He ordered drinks as he told Cassandra about his younger years with a refreshing bluntness. Vaughn had run away from a home at a young age and wandered the west, finding no shortage of trouble to become an infamous gambler and duelist. One fateful day, however, he played against a powerful man, taking a fortune from him. The man was furious telling Vaughn to leave the country and renounce gambling on pain of death. That's when Vaughn headed to Mexico. He'd been miserable ever since. When he heard about the tournament, he decided he didn't care anymore. It was worth the risk to play again. What else was life for? Sandra asked what all that had to do with her. He looked at her wistfully. He told her that he saw his younger self in Cassandra. She had inspired him to take his guns off the, book, off the hook and go looking for trouble again. There was one person he would love to ride with. It was her. Yeah, Cassandra uh, accepted Vaughn's offer. Uh, to keep the numbers low, she asked Felicia to stay behind. Yeah, I think Vaughn's a much more enticing character anyway. So we now have Jim Vaughn in our party. He has a lot of damage. <laughs> Give that to her to regenerate a 20 luck per turn. That's pretty good. Give him some extra aim, extra sight. Alright, that looks good to me. Alright, so we didn't... Oh, we have something over here. Hacienda Rossetti. Alright, I'm going to call the episode here. I know we didn't do any fighting. Um, it's not a very combat-intensive uh, scenario. Uh, next time we'll visit the Hacienda Rossetti and uh, go to the La Fortuna residence. And continue from there. But for now, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.